Welcome to Stand, 100% of your recommended daily dose of courage. We're here to help equip and empower you to stand for what you believe, to stand for others, and to stand for what's right. I'm your host, Kelly Chewbacca, a former government watchdog and candidate for U.S. Senate from Alaska. And as always, I'm joined by my best friend and husband, my favorite co-host, Nikki Chewbacca. Don't forget to subscribe to our show at The Stand Show on YouTube. And on social media, you can follow us at Kelly for Alaska. On the website, standshow.org, let's keep growing our community of standouts. Invite friends and family to subscribe to our show. This week, if you leave a review for the show, you can be our lucky audience member to receive a free Hydro Flask sticker. So make sure to leave a review. It's an honor to have with us former Acting Attorney General of the United States of America, Matt Whitaker. In 2004, President George W. Bush nominated Matt Whitaker to serve as United States Attorney for the Southern District of Iowa. And during his first year in office, Matt issued an epic five hundred indictments, over half of which were drug prosecutions. In November 2009, he resigned his role as U.S. Attorney after President Obama's nominee for that position was confirmed. But in 2017, he returned to public office when then-Attorney General Jeff Sessions appointed him as Chief of Staff for the Department of Justice Attorney General. After Attorney General Jeff Sessions resigned, Matt became Acting Attorney General of the United States from November 2018 through February 2019. For those of you who remember those times, he stood firm through several contentious challenges. Matt's been a tireless and courageous voice for justice and the rule of law. You can learn more about his time in the Trump administration in a book he wrote, Above the Law, the inside story of how the Justice Department tried to subvert President Trump. Purchase it at barnesandnoble.com or on Amazon. Welcome to Stand, Matt. We're so honored to have you with us. Kelly, it's so good to be with you and Nikki, a couple DOJ alums yourself, and uh, just really a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks, Matt. It's great to have you. I'm sure many of our viewers and listeners have seen your face on cable news, have heard your voice on radio shows, giving your analysis on significant legal issues. Um, So they they know something about Matt the professional. Uh, We'd love for them to learn a little bit about Matt the person. Can you tell us something about you that perhaps folks in our audience don't know, maybe a fun story or anecdote? Well, I have so many fun stories, uh, you know, but I mean, I think a lot of people um, don't don't realize that I was, uh, you know, mostly paid for my college and law school and my MBA at the University of Iowa by playing football. And mm-hmm. I graduated three and a half years from undergrad, was in law school my senior year. And uh, I know many people like kind of think I look like a football player, but I'm not sure they appreciate that that was really my my first love was sports. I still love watching sports. I can't, at my age, uh, it gets a little tough to participate, especially in football. I played uh, adult hockey for a decade, had a blast wow. doing that. Um, I used to say that my my drinking team has a hockey problem. <laughs> <laughs> but we sure, it was a great, great group of guys and, and, and girls, actually. We had a, we usually had at least one or two uh, women that played on our team as well. And we just had, we had a lot of fun. The Alaska crowd goes wild. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So you served in the United States Attorney General's office uh, during an incredibly tumultuous time. Yeah. And you talk about it in your book, Above the Law. Um, can you tell us about some of the biggest challenges that you faced as chief of staff or even as acting attorney general yeah. and how you dealt with them? Yeah, I think the hardest thing uh, that I dealt with, especially as chief of staff, is, you know, I got there uh, after uh, General Sessions had been in office for about eight months. And the relationship with the White House was broken. Uh, you know, President Trump obviously uh, was frustrated with Jeff Sessions as attorney general. And my job was to, you know, make sure that the trains ran on time at DOJ, make sure that we accomplished the mission of President Trump had given the Department of Justice uh, several very broad, um, uh, you know, sort of mission statement. And one of those was to reduce crime in America, 
Another mm-hmm. one was to dismantle or you know transnational criminal organizations, and those those two alone were you know a full time job of keeping DOJ focused. You know, one of the things uh, that I also brought to that role was making sure uh, that we understood where we were going. Uh, I think for you know it was a little bit because of that relationship with the White House, it was very reactionary. And so I tried to to make sure that everyone uh, that was, you know, especially Trump appointees, whether it was in the Office of Legal Policy, Office of Legal Counsel, you know, the 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 comm shop or or the lead shop, you know, that all those folks were pulling in the same direction that were consistent with President Trump's agenda and really what he wanted, which was to, you know, uh, you know uh, what President Trump's like. I mean, he wants uh, the American people are prosper. He wants them to be safe from violent crime and so many other things. And so we made sure that we were mission focused. Mm-hmm. It was a re- really challenging time at that point. Yeah. You know, you brought, uh, you're talking about dismantling uh, transnational criminal mm-hmm. organizations. You know, as a U.S. attorney, your, your tenure as a U.S. attorney for Southern District of Iowa, you were part of an anti-terrorism task force uh, that focused on child pornographers, or at least that was part of it. Child pornography, as as you know, ties directly to human trafficking, which has become a a really a growing problem uh, in our country. I mean, a lot of people don't necessarily realize that there are more slaves today uh, in this world than there ever have been uh, in human history. And it's certainly uh, a major issue uh, in the U.S., but you were on the front lines of this uh, as a U.S. attorney in that that task force. Can you tell our audience about one of the cases that you you prosecuted or were a part of as a part of that task force, or yeah. uh, anything you were able to com- accomplish in terms of fighting child sex trafficking at the time? Yeah, so we we hosted the first. Uh, um, human trafficking conference in Iowa when I was U.S. attorney. And it was just an issue that I think was was not um, on the forefront in those cases. You know, we had, for example, you know, a Chinese restaurant that brought um, illegal immigrants mm-hmm. in to work uh, and, you know, from China and then wouldn't let them go, essentially. You know, they kind of kept them in bondage to your point. And, you know, right now, I think there is a, a, a good movement to um, to work on the human trafficking issue and to prosecute that. But I think one of the things that I was able to bring to the to main justice in Washington, D.C., having been a U.S. attorney for over five years, is that we were able to talk that language. I was able to take those 93 U.S. attorneys across the 94 um, judicial districts and really uh, you know, talk to them about the tools they had. We were able to push more resources out uh, from the Department of Justice to those U.S. attorneys' offices and really enable them to attack, you know, these these uh, ever-increasing issues, whether it's child pornography, whether it's um, human trafficking, whether it is the fentanyl crisis. You know, we work very hard on, uh, you know, lowering, uh, especially in the districts hit the hardest by the uh, opioid and fentanyl crisis, lowering the prosecutorial um, requirements to bring those cases federally. And so we were able to really address uh, so many issues. And a lot of that, and again, I don't take all the credit. I think it was a, it was a massive team effort, but the voice that I was able to provide in the especially on the fifth floor in the U.S. in the attorney general's office was having been, uh, you know, a U.S. attorney and knowing how those offices operated and how those U.S. attorneys could be effective in combating some of these, you know, ma- major crises we were facing. That's amazing. If, if I could just ask a quick follow up, would you say that with the open border policy that we've mm-hmm. had under the Biden administration, that human trafficking has gotten worse? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, Nikki, you, you, you're, you're, you know, we all see it with our own eyes, right? I mean, we see how many people are pouring across that southern border. But you know, what's really happening, in addition to the the human catastrophe and and those folks that are being trafficked, is the the especially the 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 the, the people and the payloads that are the paying ones right. are being uh, put through the areas where post after the 
distraction is made by sending these caravans of folks and the hundreds of you know of groups that maybe hadn't paid the traffickers as much and were intentionally being you know caught they take so much resources that border patrol and and ice and and dea and all the folks and the resources we have on the southern border can't pay attention to these clandestine uh groups that are then coming in outside of the ports of entry it's a really it's an insidious uh scheme that is in exact uh, relation to the policies that we're applying at the southern border. You know, I was able to uh, look at this issue down in Arizona just recently and to see how these trafficking organizations were doing it and to, to understand how kind of simple it would be to combat many of these things, not only to secure the southern border, but then to, you know, set up a series of checkpoints because uh, there's only a few roads, especially in Arizona, that are coming out uh, of the southern border. And, you know, some of that uh, territory is in a an Indian reservation as well. But even coming out of that Indian reservation, there'd be so many ways for law enforcement to really, you know, clamp down on so much of this illegality at the southern border. And it's just, a, it's a matter of that the Biden administration doesn't want to do that. And they never have. They, you know, they felt like they were reversing our policies and the Trump administration is somehow was a win, you know, for, you know, their viewpoint. But at the end of the day, it's just causing chaos. We're seeing this in our major cities. I mean, even New York City and Mayor Adams are crying uncle. They're saying we can't do this anymore. We can't take this many people. We can't deal with them. Hmm. Uh, it's just it's it's madness and chaos uh, right. right now. You're absolutely right, Matt. Um, once you understand human trafficking, you see it, you can't unsee it. We can't be the land of the free unless we're all free. So now this is everybody's cause. We're going to take a short break, and after the break, we'll be back with Matt Whitaker, former Acting Attorney General of the United States of America. Stand by. Tactical specializes in combat effective weapon systems and prides themselves on the best prices in the state of Alaska. Weka Tactical sells firearms, ammunition, gear, body armor, night vision, and much more. They offer a price match guarantee as well as a 15% discount to all first responders. Visit Weka Tactical at 5630 B Street in Anchorage. Weka Tactical, Alaska's premier store for combat effective weapon systems. We're back on stand with former acting attorney general Matt Whitaker making touchdowns for courage. Matt, before the break, we were talking about all the things that we were doing that you were doing to help stop human trafficking it strikes me that as the former person in charge of all prosecutions in the United States you know a thing or two about prosecutions ethical responsibilities and the role of a prosecutor so can you give us your take on how these prosecutions are going these prosecutors and um, the prosecutions against President Trump, how are they stewarding their ethical roles and responsibilities? There's a lot of chatter in the news about it, but you're kind of the source of authority on this, having yeah. led the Department of Justice and been a prosecutor for so much of your life. Yeah, Kelly. You know, what I would say is uh, something I've said several times uh, recently, and that is the the path to justice is actually a well-worn path. And, you know, when we were when I was prosecutor and we were doing cases, we were not only following the law, but that law was well established. There was a lot of case law around those statutes. And so we knew kind of where we were going with those prosecutions, what we had to prove, uh, and then you know what, what we had to do to get folks sentenced uh, and, and have significant jail time so they could, you know, most times these were people, that, in fact, all the time, they were people that deserved to be off the street and were a menace to society and were disruptive to their local communities. That being said, you know, I look at these cases, uh, you know, and just even the most recent uh, case uh, in Georgia, and that is a RICO conspiracy, a racketeering corrupt organization that, you know, essentially tries to take something that was, you know, targeted mobsters and gangsters. Right. Um, and ultimately was then applied to political speech and political activity. Uh, and, and I think that is, that's the kind Which of- Which is First know, Amendment. Extension language that you right. just used. Yeah, First <laughs> yeah. Amendment protected, you know, speech and activities. And, you know, and, and so, you know, it really it extends the law. If you think of the law as a rubber band, it takes it well beyond its stretching point to its snapping point. Hmm. And there's no case law on this because nobody's ever done a case like this. And, you know, I can look at, um, you know, other uh, the other, you know, series of cases and each one is kind of a 
an aggressive application. You know, for example, the documents case, the Mar-a-Lago case, you know, that's another aggressive use uh, of the Espionage Act, an act that was, you know, trying to catch, um, you know, a, a controversial act, uh, in fact, uh, when it was passed during World War One, that then was used by Woodrow Wilson to punish his political enemies. And now we're seeing Joe Biden use the same statute to pu punish his most likely political opponent in the 2024 presidential election. So, you know, I, I look at all of this and I go back to what I said earlier, which is, you know, typically these cases we did at the Department of Justice and prosecuted were cases that, you know, had had a lot of precedent that that had you've done these types of cases before, you know, you'd done felon in possession of a firearm, you had done, you know, illegal possession intent to distribute narcotics, we had done, you know, illegal immigrants, uh, you know, that had Ill illegally entered our country more than once and therefore were felons. I mean, there's so many of these cases that were just, um, you know, were typical. And, and, and in each one of these cases is just a unique uh, and uh, really novel extension of where the law is and, and by very aggressive prosecutors that really only want to just get Trump. I think that's a really a point you made. You were following precedent. And so many times we see articles and commentary on these cases saying these are unprecedented and the rule of law is based on precedent. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and I guess to my point, um, these cases, uh, each one is probably going to find their way to uh, higher courts, whether that's courts of appeal or ultimately the Supreme Court. And that's the first time they ever, we'll have ever seen these statutes applied to this set of facts sure. uh, in any kind of, um, you know, close kind of way. So it's going to be it's going to be a very uh, interesting twisting and turning um, uh, time in the, you know, in the coming months. Yeah. You know, uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz, former professor of uh, criminal law at Harvard Law School, you've seen him on uh, talk shows and he's talked about how if you're going to prosecute uh, a former president, you better have an airtight, strong, robust case. And his criticism has been, to your point, that these these cases are such a stretch, and it say, it sets a very dangerous precedent. Uh, and so, uh, following up on that, you know, you referenced how there there have been multiple indictments of President Trump that are historically mm -hmm. unprecedented. And we're hoping haven't changed how politics in our country is done, but it looks like they, they may have. And there are millions of Americans across the country who are beginning to believe our constitutional republic has now become a banana republic. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking to themselves, or this is something at least I've thought to myself, I've mentioned to Kelly recently, you know, I'd love to see, you know, make America great again policies out there, but man, right now, we just need to make America, America again. Um, so just question for you, what would you say to folks who are feeling that that sense of real um, cynicism or disappointment or despair or concern about the trajectory of our, our nation and how law enforcement is being used in the sphere of politics. How do we pull back from this precipice, or or have we already plummeted <laughs> over it at this point? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think the first, you know, my initial gut reaction to that is we need to go back and study our history. Uh, you know, I think mm -hmm. our founding fathers were very concerned about factionalism and you know this partisan, um, you know we win, you lose kind of a binary choice. And, and I think the way we come back from this, Nikki, is really it's, it's we need more statesmen and stateswomen, people that uh, put the country first, uh, you know, obviously uh, have a set of ideologies that lend themselves to one party or the other, but ultimately are doing what's in the best interest of the American people. Because I think, you know, one of the things uh, that was really uh, the key to Donald Trump's success, and you know, especially in my home state of Iowa, for example, is he spoke to you know what's oftentimes called the forgotten man, but you know, to small town America, the folks that you know don't live in big cities, that don't want uh, all the big city hassles of crime and traffic and uh, those types of things, and are probably oftentimes willing to sacrifice a little high speed internet for that. <laughs> That's um, right. In exchange, but I, but I, but I, but I think really we just we need we need more statesmen and stateswomen, folks that are going to put 
away their partisan ideologies. And I and I look at on the left especially, I mean, there's not a single person of good faith that I could name right now that doesn't just hate Trump so much, that has Trump derangement syndrome, that just want to get him uh, however they can off the national stage. And it's really, it's a shame, uh, you know, because, you know, Donald Trump did so many good things in his uh, first term as it relates to the, you know, the the American worker, especially, and, and to America's strength, uh, both nationally and abroad. And, you know, there just, there were so many policies that he was able to implement that, that really, you know, allowed Americans to succeed. And now, you know, with inflation uh, uh, unreasonably high, uh, hard to tame right now, I think a lot of Americans are feeling a, a significant pinch, and especially those that are either on fixed incomes or that are working hard uh, but can't seem to, you know, get ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people are feeling that. A lot of people feeling discouraged, but it sounds like you're saying there is still hope because yeah. there are normal people out there um, who can, who do put country first and who can do something yeah. about it. Um, speaking you know, of- but The other thing, Kelly, not to interrupt, but I'm, and yeah, I'm sorry, but one of the other things that comes to mind is, you know, we've, because of how awful the mainstream media is and how they treat mm -hmm. uh, especially candidates on the right um you know our best and brightest are oftentimes not willing to run you know that it's just it's not worth it, it you know and 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 I, and I go back to our founding fathers so often but they they really wanted folks that would would sacrifice for their country that would that would serve for a limited time and then go back to the communities in which they lived and live under the laws they passed and you know, this whole That's movement right. for career politicians, and I know you have this in Alaska, same problem we have in Iowa, but it's these career politicians uh, that have known nothing other than being elected. And right. they haven't, you know, oftentimes haven't signed the front of a paycheck and they haven't, uh, you know, lived in the real world in a meaningful way in, in decades. And, and I think, you know, that's that's one of our biggest problems right now as a country. I think those are all really good observations. Um, I appreciate that you're someone who despite all the bad stuff the media has done to you, you continue to stand up and do something. And that's a large part of what our show is about. Uh, bad stuff will happen, but just like you said, yeah. that didn't deter the people who founded our country. You know, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their reputations. They said their sacred honor. Um, yeah. But we've inherited what we have because of what they did. And we're looking for, as you said, people who, who love something more than just their creature comforts and the convenience and anonymity of their life who are willing to do something more. And that could be something as simple as going to your local city council meetings and mm -hmm. showing up to vote and maybe taking a bold stand at a school board meeting. Those kind of things actually do make a difference because you don't accomplish anything by sitting down on a sofa. Um, you do accomplish things by taking the journey that you've taken to just continue to fight for justice and fight for what's right. And then you end up taking over the Department of Justice. And that's kind of how that happens. But ordinary Americans can do extraordinary things by just doing a little extra. And that's how we get there. Um, we're coming up on a quick break. But when we come back, I want to continue to talk about these um, prosecutions that have turned political, because that's kind of one of the things yeah. that wasn't ever supposed to happen in America. As you said, they talk about that in the Federalist Papers. And mm -hmm. it's supposed to be one of the things that distinguishes us from other countries. And it really gets to that heart of the weaponization of government against the people and um, turning our um, law enforcement organizations against us and getting your take on that, I think is really important. So we'll be right back with former Acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker. And you can follow us at The Stand Show on YouTube or Stand with Nikki and Kelly Chewbacca on your favorite podcast platform. We'll be right back. Africa New Day with mission is actually to create leaders, change a culture, and transform a nation. We believe that this is an area where God wants us to make a difference. You know, He has called us the light of the world. Well, where does the light shine? Where there is darkness. As you pray with us, as you contribute to our efforts, we believe that together we can make a difference. Welcome back to Stand. We're with Acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker. 
and he tackles cowardice. Matt, you've been in the room <laughs> with President Trump when he's had to make really big decisions. Can you tell an audience a story about former President Trump that reflects what you really respect or like about him? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I like his toughness, uh, but I also think uh, he does not get enough credit for how smart he is and how uh, good his questions typically are. He can get to the essence of an issue uh, quicker than anybody I've really seen. And he can smell, uh, I guess this is a, a G-rated show, he can smell BS a mile away. <laughs> and say the so, same thing. you know, I've been really um, impressed with that. You know, I was... I was in a, a couple of meetings in the Situation Room uh, during the government shutdown. Uh, that was one of the other great things I was able to do was lead the Department of Justice through. I think it was a forty-plus day shutdown. It was wow. it was a difficult time, and you know, trying to you know trying to explain uh, you know and, and really keep the troops uh, rallied because you know we here we had, for example, uh, federal law enforcement agents that were willing to sacrifice their life for their country. They were being told they were essential, but. Uh, we weren't paying them. And so I, I, I think that that was a real problem. But, you know, going back to, you know, Donald Trump, I was in this meeting. Chuck Schumer was there. Uh, Dick Durbin was there. Nancy Pelosi was there. And I saw just how tough he was. Uh, but at the same time, trying to negotiate to get, you know, a deal accomplished. And I, and I just I, I, I was really impressed with how he handled that situation. Yeah, that's amazing. I totally agree with you. I remember the first time I met him in person to get the endorsement for the U.S. Senate campaign. And I'd gone through training like this in law school, even though I've never actually argued in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. They mooted us as if that one day would happen. And President Trump grilled me like a Supreme Court justice, you know, where you yeah. think that you're going to answer a question, but you only get about 20 to 30 seconds in before you're cut off and you're asked another extremely right. sharp, brilliant question. And I was always waiting for the apprentice, you're fired. <laughs> you know, it's going to happen any second. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. But yes, he's quite likely one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. Um, and he can smell BS from a mile away. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, Nikki, you had a great question that you wanted to ask. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the president's mugshot for a minute because mm -hmm. if Fannie Willis, the <laughs> district attorney for Fulton County in Georgia, if she was hoping to humiliate President Trump with that, she totally failed. I mean, it was a masterful uh, example of political jujitsu on his part. Mm -hmm. I mean, the expression on his face in that mugshot, I think, reflects how tens of millions of Americans across the country are feeling right now. They're, they're more determined than ever now to use their voices and their votes to ensure there isn't a transfer of power from we the people to we the bureaucrats, mm -hmm. which is what it feels yeah. like right now. Uh, any thoughts or words of advice or encouragement you'd have for those folks out there who um, whose hearts are reflected in that expression that President Trump had of saying, basically, I'm not going anywhere. I'm standing my ground. I'm determined to to see America prosper and continue to be free. Yeah, I think there's a lot of words of encouragement. And actually, you know, I, I, I just am reminded almost every day as I travel this country that for 247 years of American history, our greatest uh, asset and, you know, our greatest days have never been because of our government. You know, our government has never been uh, the strongest thing about America. The strongest thing about the United States of America is its people. Uh, you know, and these mm. people that are hardworking, that are determined, uh, you know, that oftentimes are, you know, come from hardy, you know, uh, almost pioneer stock that were willing to go yeah. out into the unknown and to you know set up and homestead and and so we all kind of have inherited that can do nature and i think the american people are going to be the answer for all of this and you know i think uh, as i look at uh, this great country you know some of our states uh, are are not well led our politicians to my point earlier uh, have been in the jobs oftentimes too long and are making decisions that are only in their own self-interest instead of the uh, you know their people's interest. But I do believe a renaissance uh, is about uh, to happen in the United States. Mm -hmm. I think a revival is about to happen. I think God 
uh, you know, has uh, will continue to bless this great nation uh, who, you know, unfortunately, we have oftentimes turned away from him. But I think we are turning back and, and slowly but surely. And I think we will get back to that, you know, beautiful, shining city on the hill that Ronald Reagan described as the ideal uh, for the United States of America. Hmm. I'm really encouraged by your by your hope. I want to circle back, probably our last question, but I want to talk about the book you wrote, Above the Law, the inside story of how the Justice Department tried to subvert President Trump. Can you tell our audience why you wrote it and why the information in it is so important for them to know? Yeah, so I think as I looked at my career at the Department of Justice and as I, you know, sort of was paying attention to how I was being covered, you know, I, I thought that there was people need to understand more where I was coming from first um, and then needed to understand some of the decisions that I made in the role. But I wanted to put it in the broader context of what I was sure. fighting for the time at the Department of Justice. Uh, and so it just made sense uh, to, you know, to put some thoughts down on paper. And I was lucky to have a publisher that was interested. And, uh, you know, it was obviously it was a very it was hard to do, especially as COVID was happening uh, kind of in real time. But, you know, all that to be said that, uh, you know, I'm very proud of that book. I think it stands the test of time, especially as, you know, Durham report came out yeah. and, 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 and other, you know, the other reports have come out from Congress and the like. And so, you know, I think it's a really historically accurate, uh, you know, book, but at the same time, it's kind of my experience both before I got there and what I was doing and how I was, you know, sort of my, my, my mindset going into that job and how I developed that mindset. And at the same time, you know, what the broader uh, accomplishments of the Trump administration. I think it's really important, Matt, because it's an insider expose, a contemporaneous account of the weaponization of our law enforcement agencies that right. since has been externally validated. It's like peer reviewed, right, by the Durham report, the inspector general report, who's also right. there inside the Department of Justice, the watchdog. That's actually where I started my career. It was in that office. Um, and I, th I think that that's really important. It also validates for us, though, in the audience that not every D.C. bureaucrat is actually the problem. Uh, you wrote this book from your perspective as someone who was a prosecutor in the DOJ, was a U.S. attorney in the DOJ, was the chief of staff in the DOJ, was the attorney general. A lot of us would like to point our finger at, quote, that guy and say, well, he's the deep state. You actually weren't the deep state. You exposed it. Um, I think that for all those reasons, this is a really important book. So please, audience, check it out. Above the Law, the inside story of how the Justice Department tried to subvert President Trump. Um, you can get it online. You can get it at barnesandnoble.com. Matt, thank you so much for being with us today. You're truly an inspiration to so many of us across the country. Um, you know how much I love watching you in the videos of you testifying before Congress. If you haven't seen those, audience, check it out on YouTube. We really appreciate the bold stand that you've taken for justice and for the American people. And please do come back. We really enjoy having you on the show. Well, thank you so much, Kelly and Nikki. It's great to join you today. And I look forward, you know, Alaska is one of the two states I have not been to, and I can't wait to get up there soon. Well, you are always welcome and invited. We know exactly the places to go fishing and hunting. So please. Fantastic. Two yes. of my favorite things. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to come back and be invited to come hunting and fishing with us. And to our audience, please remember, we're coming back right after this break for discussion with me and Nikki. So stand by. In the meantime, subscribe to the show. Stand with Nikki and Kelly Chewbacca. Find us on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube at The Stand Show. And on our website, standshow.org, make sure to share this episode with Matt Whitaker with your friends and family who'd be interested in hearing all of the interesting things he shared today. Stand by. We'll see you right after this break. Welcome back to Stand, where we were just wrapping up our interview with former Attorney General Matt Whitaker under the Trump administration. That was fascinating. I really enjoyed that interview. Imagine you did too, because um, we love the Department of Justice. That's where we had the start of our legal careers. Something I think is interesting is just the things that he shared in the premise of his book, Above the Law, how the Justice Department tried to subvert President Trump when they actually had him as 
their executive. Like he was the head of the government. And one of the things that we've been hearing a lot lately from Jack Smith and others is, quote, nobody is above the law and how the Justice Department, the FBI, which is in Justice Department, are all these um, sort of neutral um, arbiters of truth who just go and carry out truth in an even-handed way. And yet you hear you have the former acting attorney general and U.S. attorney um, who's, you know, the head prosecutor for a whole region saying, actually, here's my firsthand account as somebody who was on the inside and in charge of how some of the leaders and bureaucrats actually don't do that. And in my experience, and in this case, this is how they abused their power systematically and what they did intentionally to try and undermine um, their leadership, which is a complete miscarriage of justice on the one hand, but also goes against the oath of office that they take um, to uh, defend and protect the Constitution of the United States because they do have obligations under the executive branch um powers of the constitution and also it goes against what they i mean you take you did the same oaths and stuff that i took as a federal government employee like we have to execute our duties faithfully regardless of who takes power there are plenty of political appointees and presidents that i work for that i don't agree with but when i sign up to serve and carry out their mission that's my job and so so interesting to hear an attorney general come in and say actually um Interesting that when it's under the Trump administration, we don't carry out justice in an even-handed way. But now that it's two years into a different administration, every single political appointee is carrying out justice equally with complete, you know, the the spokespeople completely ignore the inspector general report. Michael Horowitz has not changed. I know him and worked with him in D.C. Um, His politics don't align with Trump's. He has not changed. His report came out and said, actually, that's not what we found. (laughs) Lady Justice has taken her blindfold off. And that's not what the Durham report found. Both of those reports were consistent in saying the Justice Department's really messed up. Those all those reports and Whitaker's book all say the same thing. The question that I think is looming huge right now is why isn't anything being done? And so I'm grateful that you see these House committee hearings happening. You see new questions being asked. But what I would like to see, and I think that you started to get into this with your questions, is I'd like to see a rallying of um, common thinking Americans, regardless of politics, coming around saying um, government is actually accountable to the people. It all starts out with we the people. And we can't allow our federal agencies to just run without accountability over us. The reason why Congress is supposed to hold the executive branch accountable is because those elected members are actually accountable to us voters. So the the way the entire hierarchy is supposed to work is the FBI, the DOJ, et cetera, are ultimately supposed to be held accountable by, held accountable by the people. And I would just like to see a little bit more of that, which is what I think his his book was supposed to expose so that people would know. And I, th- I thought all of that was really encouraging. Yeah, I thought it was, too. And, you know, I look back to, you know, our days when we were there. And yeah. you and I both know there are thousands, thousands of just amazing people yeah. there, just of both parties, all parties who yeah. love our country, love the law. And every day go to work seeking to do the right thing and see justice done. Yeah. I mean, that's... Faithfully execute their duties. Yes. And it's just those few people who, unfortunately, not only ruin the reputation of the agencies because of how politicized they've become, Mm -hmm. um, but also are undermining the institutions themselves and, and our republic. I think... You know, me having grown up in countries where coup d'etats happened um, and having family who have experienced what it's like to be under an authoritarian regime, which isn't what we have today in America. I'm not saying that. But it's a slippery slope. But what, what, what I'm getting at exactly is that we have to we have to be so careful with our freedom and 
our freedoms and, and, and the structure of what we have here in America, it's so easy to take for granted. And you talk to anybody who's lived under any kind of other government that's been, um, let's say, not as free, right, and more authoritarian, yeah. they'll say, guard your liberties because they can be easily lost. And so these folks who have gotten so focused on their hate of a person that they're willing to undermine certain basic norms of how mm -hmm. we we've approached things it's really short-sighted and it's really dangerous mm -hmm. and i just get concerned about the vicious cycle because i don't want to see mm -hmm. what's being done to president trump uh being done to somebody of another party like we don't want to get into this tick for tack back and forth and that's why i appreciated what matt said when he said we need to get more statesmen and stateswomen of either party right. who put the country first mm -hmm. and not their own sort of partisan interests. There's a, a quote by Martin Luther King Jr., who you know I've always loved and admired and has been a great sort of intellectual influence and spiritual influence on my life. Uh, he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly so in other words those are the folks who are say cheering on all of these indictments and all of these politicized attacks on the president and think that somehow it's advancing a good cause right should take a pause and realize that this is actually undermining their freedoms too they just don't see it yet. And that was what Martin Luther King Jr. was warning against is like, don't think that if you go this kind of a route mm -hmm. of sort of perverting justice, mm -hmm. that it won't boomerang back. We have to be careful. I think one of the things I hear you saying in that, that you and I've talked about a lot, is we can't love basically being pragmatists at the expense of losing our principles. Once you sacrifice principles like the Constitution or liberty or freedom because you think the ends justify the means, no, the means or the process, if you will, the principles actually what has to be protected. We either love First Amendment rights for everybody, even if we, for example, don't like what's being said, or we don't like the person saying it, or we don't like their religion, or fill in the blank. Or we find ourselves in these situations through history that we all universally condemn and say, let's never go back to that. But when we do things like you said, personalize it or partisanship it or um, choose to erase history and forget some of the lessons that we should have learned, we find ourselves repeating it and going back to the human rights atrocities and the civil rights violations, the civil liberties violations that we have fought so hard for. And I think one of the things that um, really grieves our hearts and disturbs us, things that we need to take a stand for, are remembering the people who have fought, who have died, who have suffered, who have um, been tortured and traumatized and imprisoned for these principles that we need to take a stand for. So it doesn't help for us to be silent and be muted and well I want my life to go easy your life's not going to go easy that one thing we can guarantee is this life's going to have hardship and suffering it will have more if you stand on the sidelines and be quiet while you see a significant erosion happening of these principles that other people have fought and held so dear for. Um, you can fill in the blank, whether it's free speech, um, freedom of expression of religion, um, things that Matt was talking about, like justice, fill in the blank. Um, you know, some of the things that we're seeing right now happen in culture, like the advancement of women's rights, and then some of those things just really being revoked right now. If you don't stand and just do even your little part of saying, actually, this is where I stand and I'm not going to move on this, then what's going to happen is it's going to affect you and your bubble, your family, your community, your children. 
and that's why you're going to pay. Seeing, and that's why we're seeing a groundswell, I think, across party lines uh, of people just saying, hey, mm -hmm. enough's enough. We have our differences. We're, we may always have our differences, but this isn't how we sort them out. That's we're right. We're Americans. We need to find solutions. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what our country is supposed to do different. You know, when I think about the story of your family and everything that you guys have been through, I think about the story of America and everything we've been through, that our country is actually made up of people who've been th through the changes of other countries and all their suffering. And I like the hope that I hear in stories like Matt's, where mm -hmm. he's optimistic about the future, because I think we all can be, but it takes us standing. There's always hope as long as we're standing. As long There's as we're standing. Hope. And that's where it comes back to you, our standouts in our community. Thanks for standing with us. You'll find us at The Stand Show on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe. Also on your favorite podcast platform, Stand with Nikki and Kelly Chewbacca. You can send this out to your friends and family. Make sure to share the episode so that they can hear all this wisdom from Matt Whitaker, the former attorney general. And you could be our lucky winner this week of a free Hydro Flask sticker. If you leave a review, we'll be happy to send you one if you're selected as our lucky winner. We'll see you next week. Make sure to stand firm and stand strong. Sometimes the winning comes just from the standing.